to say. Yeah, so yeah, he's a he's a great war gamer. He really cracks the code on PC ga- uh, PC games on games really quickly. Mm-hmm. Blows me away. We'll we'll start playing. I'll read the rules. He'll read the rules. We'll turn up to play. And at first, I thought it was because he was playing the game before we got together, you know. And so like getting that getting an edge. But then it's not. He just grocks systems really quickly, and what he's always like two or three turns ahead of me, working out how to play the game. <laughs> It's funny because I think every group's got one or two of those guys. I know we do. Yeah. And uh, Tom Thornson is one of those guys. He posts on Console World every once in a while. He's exactly that kind of guy. The kind of guy you definitely want to play test your game. Yes. Yeah. Because he will get to the essence of everything really quickly. Right. And, you know, he'll, he'll be the guy who can think, like you say, a few moves ahead and then he finds that one problem. Right. That maybe nobody else spotted. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or he works out how to win with the system the way the system is too, which uh, right. which is always right. you know always kind of cool as well. Yeah. So, so, so you've been busy, right? Well, you're always busy by the looks of it. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it's I always I got into this very slowly, and I thought, oh, well, it's going to die out after a couple of designs, you know, and uh, or I'll get, as I go on, I'll get tired of doing it. And or I'll run out of ideas. And the strangest thing is that as as it goes on and as things become successful and people like the stuff, it just kind of motivates you to think about even more things. So now, now you know I'm busy as hell and I've got ideas for like another six designs in my head swimming around. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> Sadly, it's worrisome because I plan on retiring next year. And I was just telling Nancy, my girlfriend, I said, I don't know what's going to happen once I retire. Am I going to design more or less? I'm not sure. What if I take a call for something? I don't know. We're not going to let that happen. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's good. She, you know, she never gives me a hard time about it because she says it keeps your you know, brain from... Uh, uh, Atrophying. Molding up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, exactly. It keeps, it keeps all the synapses firing. Right. Very cool. Well, um, now where do you live? Where are you? So I'm in Bellport, New York, which is out on Long Island. Okay, New York Club. Is it? Okay. Whatever. Okay. He, he's, I don't know if it's the same group, but yeah. Yeah, you know that little, the little basement New York Gamers Club that you go down the stairs? <laughs> it's in Brooklyn. You go down the stairs past the trash cans, and there's this basement full of war games, right? Okay. There's like 10 tables and huge monsters set up everywhere. It's a pretty cool space. Uh, Minis and things. Uh, not the not the highly refined cigar-smoking, whiskey-drinking Mark Herman and the other boys. Not Muldoon. No, those guys are... They don't hang that's out. That's J.R. Tracy's group. They're actually in Manhattan. Yes, yes. Not, uh, not Tracy's group. They're a little more okay. elite and refined. I, they don't to acknowledge I, my existence yet. <laughs> That's too bad. I'll, I'll get Scott turned on to you. I'm, I'm pretty good friends with Scott. Yeah, all right. Well, tell him, I'm, tell him I'm not a complete dick, just a partial one. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. Well, well so look, I, I know you've got, so you've got the crowbar thing, and uh, I had wanted to do some homework on In, Mag- in Magnificent Style before mm-hmm. we had a conversation. And, I have failed at doing that. So, okay. what I what I we, we pick a game or a series of games. And so, what I want to do is get inside the designer's head a little bit, right? And just yeah. just uh, let's just talk about how you design the game. And, and if you didn't, you know, because you're going to use other people, and you've got developers, maybe, and you've got you know Mike Walker, and you've got map people, and all that. How you came up with the idea? So let's maybe talk about Crowbar and its der- it, its derivation from in magnificent style and how and if that is the case and how that all kind of came to be i'm that's what i'm keen to understand is i want to get inside that little brain of yours and dig in and find out how, how it all really happened right? you have to look very carefully <laughs> yeah. hey we found a brain cell it's all good so with that let's let's talk a little bit about the genesis of crowbar that's fine. You're going to find that I'm not one of these egghead designers. No, so I'm not no. going to sit here pontificating for 20 minutes about, you know, every little... I design the same way I like to play, but just by feel. And, and how how did you come up with the idea to focus on this one segment and very difficult uh, 
military operation and one segment of the whole Normandy landings. What 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 what, what was the catalyst there? The, the, the catalyst, catalyst was so, so in magnificent, magnificent style was about, about tickets charge. charge. Okay, okay, so, so that, that actually, actually started as a World War One trench design. Huh. Because, yeah, yeah, because I, I was always fascinated with World War One, and I could never figure out, like, oh, my God, you know, everybody does either the invasion of Belgium in 1914 or the Kaiserslautern in 1918, and all the years in between are just totally forgotten about. <laughs> so, so I said, well, obviously, it's because it's, uh, you know, predominantly trench warfare. So I said, well, how do I make trench warfare an entertaining gaming experience? And <clears throat> I don't know, I, to be honest with you, I don't know how it dawned on me, but I remember... <clears throat> a push the luck dice game that I used to play with my grandmother when she came over from Germany called uh, Schwein, which was Pig. Yeah. And it was this idea of rolling two dice and adding the dice together, and you can stop anytime you want, but if one of the two dice was a one, you would lose whatever you earned in that round, and you'd have to pass the dice over. And if you roll snake eyes, you'd lose everything that you had accumulated up to that point. Very simple game, taught you math. So, yeah, you know, risk, reward, all that kind of thing. So somehow I translated that push your luck element into how, how far do you move your troops against a wall of enemy fire. So that accomplished two things. It, it, became, it became a push your luck, risk, reward uh, mechanic. But it also what it did is it let the game play faster because it's not a typical war game in that you're not taking a CRT and calculating every single bit of uh, Union fire on you as you're moving your troops across. What it does is I work it out so that the, the, the fire is, is replicated in the dice roll itself. So it's an attritional die roll where you're pushing your men forward, they're taking casually based on your dice, so you're not really doing another CRT type of deal. Right, one die roll. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so then, then it was just an element of uh, pushing your luck again. It eventually went from World War One to uh, I was doing it for Alan Emmerich at BPG at the time, and he wanted something a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more uh, popular, something that would sell. So of course Gettysburg is always you know the day Gettysburg Waterloo, <laughs> and. Uh, so, so then I had to think of a situation where that element, that push your luck element, would come in, and then of course I, you know, I thought, well, Pickett's Charge, obviously. Who would, do, who would be stupid enough to do a game on Pickett's Charge? Right? So it has to be done solitaire, and it has to be done with a push your luck element, and it all just kind of gelled from there. Um, so we were always trying to find other battles to do. So, you know, people came up with some idea, you know, Charge of Light Brigade always came up. Um, what else was there? The, the, the guard at Waterloo, uh, things like that. These games were all in the works from other designers, but they just never got published. Hmm. So this is how many years ago was Magnificent Style? That's six years ago or so, I think it was published, and the rest of them never came out. And I finally decided, I'm going to find another game. I'm going to bring this the system back. And again, I had to think of something that would apply. It's, it's, it's tough, tough to get that situ that military situation where you're doing these kind of suicidal, quote-unquote, mm -hmm. charges mm -hmm. or attacks mm -hmm. to, to, to get those mechanics to work right. And uh, I don't know what it was. It might have been a D-Day anniversary, June 6th thing or something. I saw something about Point de Hoc and I started doing some research and I remember the scene from The Longest Day where the guys were, that was a really cool scene too, where they, you know, going up the, the grappling hooks and the, and the rope ladders and I said, well, that's a perfect situation. It's World War II, it's popular, it's D-Day, it's popular. And this is an epic, uh, uh, courageous attack that these guys carried out. Almost, it, it was seemingly impossible for them to carry it out. Yes. Only 225 guys. Right, right. Trying to land on a beach, climb 100-foot cliffs in the face of the German, and then go find the guns, and then go establish a roadblock. And uh, it seemed just to fit perfectly. So then, uh, you know, at that point, I wanted, you know, I contacted Mark Walker about doing something like that. Fascinating. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so now, when you, when you originally designed in magnificent style, and that came out, what was the marketplace reaction like? Uh, were you surprised by the reaction to the game? I recall it being very popular. I, I'm, I'm always surprised, surprised when my games are popular. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, 
and I'm not kidding. Right. Uh, right. I always, I, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I just, uh, well, I'm going to publish this thing. Uh, nobody's going to like it. That's my great fear, you know. And, uh, I was I was surprised that it did well. The, the thing about that game, I guess it would be considered, I, I wanted to make it more palatable to the general gaming public, so it's war game, and this is something that you'll find, I think, in a lot of my design, is I, is I, tr is I try to get past the old school war gaming tropes, you know, and try to try to get people to, you know, try new ideas, try to get more people interested in war gaming, I guess. So that was one of the first ones to do that. So I was glad it was well received, and I and I and I and I was a little surprised because I thought, well, nobody's going to buy a game like Pickett's Charge, you know, and. Uh, and I, yeah, and, and you know the funny thing is, I was just telling uh, my developer friend Manzo, I said I still 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 see people posting on Facebook on in, in magnificent style. The thing's been out for six years, and they're still posting about it. So it's it's very rewarding. Okay, you call me mid sip of my my cocktail. Uh, so so uh, the the crowbar situation. So I I was fortunate enough to receive a book about. Uh, I think it's a lieutenant colonel when he climbs the cliffs, but Rudder was Rudder, yeah. yeah. And fascinating guy, funnily enough, Texan and an Aggie. Uh, my, my wife's an Aggie and my, my older son's an Aggie. And uh, I guess there's something in that military, military tradition there that uh, breeds great military competence and, mm -hmm. uh, and some crazy heroics as well. So, so did you do background research, or did you? Was it the longest day and the the challenge that was the inspiration? That, that was the initial inspiration. Just the whole story. You know, of course, I remembered Reagan's speech from the eighties, uh, "The Boys of Point to Hawk," and the book. And uh, so, I mean, I always go back now, and, and I, you know, I have a couple books up here on on the. Uh, on the Believe it or not, there's not that many books on yeah, Point to Hawk. Yeah. It's usually part of a D-Day book. <clears throat> right, right, right. But uh, I actually have the Osprey book, which is really well done, called Rangers Lead the Way. That, that's really well done. I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah, and um, <clears throat> the more I read about it, actually, uh, it encouraged me to keep going with the design. Because, you know, you have the idea, you know, initially, and then you start laying things out, and you go, all right, well, man, is this really a good idea or not? And, and then, then as I read more and more about what happened at, during the attack, what they were actually looking for. So, so one of the elements of the crowbar game is, you know, there's these six guns that they're looking for. And strangely enough, when they got up there, the guns weren't there. Right. Which they didn't know. So the Germans had moved them in the meantime. One, I think, if I remember correctly, one was destroyed by the aerial bombardment, and then they moved the other ones to the away and hid them in the back. So the Rangers, instead of just stopping and saying, well, it's it, they're not here, they went to look for them. So that's that that was that added a nice dimension to the game, because now it's not just a war game if you're beating the Germans. It's a mystery game to a certain degree, too, because one of your jobs is to go find these guns. Now, in the game, you can find the guns in a lot of different places. Yes. Uh, well, a lot of logical places, um, but nonetheless, it's not confined to where you would have found them, uh, where they would have found historically. They could be found anywhere. So you have to go searching around for these guns and seeing if you can find them and destroy them. And there's other things you can find, too. Right, right. And I, found, I found that fascinating. So I've read the rules. I've got it set up, and uh, we're, uh, I'm reconciling with Mark on it because you know, he made me a set of counters. So I'm, I'm reconciling what what I have or don't have, you know. To mm -hmm. so we've got a couple of a couple of misfits. So I'm just making sure that I know what I'm supposed to do, and uh, and I'm ex I'm excited about the 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 way in which you go about finding the guns and the the, the ri you know it adds another layer over and above in, in magnificent style to the risk that you're taking with okay. with you know your your you've got these pre. Uh, battery, you know, these battery uh, attacks that you you lay on the map mm -hmm. first, and then you're advancing in columns. I want to talk to you about the, the the column mechanic as well, and why you know wh why that was chosen and things like that. But but it, it it's got a lot more layers to it, it seems to me, than in magnificent style, which felt like okay, I kind of kind of got to get to the finish line, and what I do on right. right. 
here there's there's supplemental or or secondary objectives that that really give it would appear to give it richness. I can't say it does because I haven't played it yet, right? But uh, but I'm sure right. you, that that must have been uh, satisfying. I'm, I'm guessing it was, it was and, and and the, and the and historical story, story let me do that. Yes. So, so the situation, situation really, you know, I didn't, I didn't have, have to make up stuff to add. Right. The, the, the whole richness of that situation just, just let me build all that in there, and it just logically... Whoops. Oh, I'm losing... Well, losing? Yeah, we got, we got a little bit of uh, lag there. It's probably... Uh, we got we have thunderstorms coming through here, so... Okay. Well, if I lose you, we'll, uh, we'll try and reconnect. A bit, uh, okay. okay it's, it's um, so, so what I was saying is the uh, the historical situation let you all let me also add the the roadblock element to the game. Right. So not only do you have to go find you have to defeat the Germans, you have to go find these guns, but now the added element is you have to get to that highway that's on the far side of the map and set up a roadblock. Right. So. Everything built up very nicely to this push your luck, uh, have to, you know, accomplish these missions in a certain amount of time. That's one thing I learned uh, about the push your luck element in, in Magnificent Style, is that uh, when I first designed it, I had like uh, 10 game turns or something like that. And then you, you realize very quickly, there's no incentive for anybody to push your luck when you give them too many turns to do whatever they have to do, right? So that's why, that's why the game's only five game turns long, because you don't have time to sit and fart, and fart around in your own lines. You have to get going, right? Yep. So in, in what I did with, uh, with, with the crowbar is the battle was three days. So there is a push your luck element to the time, but there's also a push your luck element into accomplishing your missions on the first day, especially getting the guns. Because getting the guns on the third day doesn't do you that much good because the U.S. has landed already at, at Omaha Beach. You know, so finding that you get a lot more victory points if you accomplish these things on the first day. Yes, yes. And then there's other things you get on the second day, you don't want to take a lot of casualties, I think. That kind of thing. Right. And and then uh, so so there's a richness to there's a I, I love the connection of the simple concept of pushing your luck right from Schwang right to right. to tying that into military history so that works in a lovely way when you looked at the designing the map for crowbar and coming up with the ideas for gun placement and art and and the columns tell me all, tell me about your your thinking around that what what drove what drove those those uh, methods and approaches well once you start pushing your luck like that I have to visualize it that I'm, if I if I if you make it too flexible then it just becomes too complex Right? Especially with a push your luck element. Because right now I'm going to push my luck sideways, I'm going to push my luck backwards. Or if you, if you allow too much flexibility, then the whole thing kind of falls apart. And, become, and in Magnificent Style, it was originally designed to be a nice, quick, solitaire game. You know, a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of tension, and a lot of risk reward. And the, the simplest way to do that was just to get these guys. It just worked really well that you, you're down this, uh, somebody called swimming lanes. Right. And uh, I actually saw an article, there was an article uh, in a miniatures magazine that somebody directed me to, that somebody used that idea for a miniatures version of Pickett's Charge. And what it does, it just lets you use that push your luck element logically in a column. Right, right. Makes sense. Okay, okay. So that's interesting. And, and, and now who was the... It's, who was, it's a simplicity thing too. You know, it's, it's the u uniqueness of it. Yes, yes. So... And I and uh, after we after we we wrap up, oh, I, I have a couple of questions for you that we'll we'll keep at, we'll keep out of the interview. <laughs> but uh, sure. I'm just making the note of the time now for that comment. But um, with the map, talk to me about the map because it's gorgeous. It's rich uh, that's, and beautiful. That's, that's, Tell me about the map designer and how it, were you involved in that? Did you uh, were you directing or did that just magically happen? Well, that was that's Tim Allen, who is uh, who I've been working with since I started designing. He's he's, in my opinion, one of the best out there. 
as far as uh, taking your vision and applying it to a map and and we knew that with this map had to have that if, you know, if you see if you see photographs of that area now even mm -hmm. and I actually put them in the rule book I don't, know if, I don't know if it's on the copy that you got. Yeah, I got the final, it's, got the it's final just uh, PDF. Piece. So it looks, yes, it is. Those great pictures. It's a fascinating place, right? And if you see it after it was bombarded by the Allies, it's, it looks like a moonscape. Yes. And uh, so I did send I sent him some maps and just told him, look, you know, we have to have a, you know, the gun pits go here, 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 and we have to have this. I mean, it is a bit abstracted, obviously, because you're using squares and it's not perfectly right you know it's abstracted the sea areas are abstracted and, um but that that was all tim after that you know um we really wanted to you know we were toying with the idea of really bombing the the map out but then we thought it would look too obnoxious if we put too many craters on it the way it really looked but uh you know that was all tim man he does great work when he's inspired boy he's the best yes <laughs> yeah and, and, fun, and funnily enough with him i it took me a while to put two and two together, but as usual. But uh, he, uh, he and I played a game of the Russian campaign on Vassal, probably seven or eight years ago when I first got back into wargaming. And he, wow! And he was super nice, and he was telling me how he designed maps and in his spare time, and he, he I think he was, he works at a university or something like that. I, I don't know. His the librarian, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's a librarian. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I was like, "Wow, that's really, really cool." And then we, you know, we I, we moved on and did different things. And then I, I started blogging and reconnected with him. So I follow all his artwork that he posts online. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. Great guy. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's Canadian. He's a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. They're all. I thought you were, <laughs> they're all they're they're nice. so annoyingly nice. Yeah. 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 He does really great work. I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen the uh, science fiction stuff he does for me, uh, Invaders from Dimension X and Space Vermin from Beyond and all that. Dude, that's all. If only, that's all Tim. And Tim, Tim loves doing the sci-fi stuff. And if he can, if you let him get creative, you know, and let him just do his thing, it, it's great. It really is great. Invaders from Dimension X was the best. I shouldn't say the best. It was one of the best solo game experiences that I've had. Right. It's great. That, oh, that's great. That's a great game because you're. It's rich in decision making for the game player, right? It's fabulous, right. right? So the. Unfortunately, Mark doesn't. Uh, you know, I can't get Mark to hook me up on any of these things anymore. So I'll just leave that there, Mark. You know, buddy, <laughs> uh, and we'll move on. So maps. All right. So counter counter artwork. Talk to me about the counters. They're big. They looks like they're going to be. You know, the the classic. Flying pig style, large yep. format, rich artwork. Why top down? Uh, well, first of all, the size of them obviously is marked. That's the flying pig tradition, and uh, they're they're really it's really great as we get older to have these one inch square yeah, counters. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, top down, we use top down in, in magnificent style, and we had toyed with the sideways thing. It just didn't it just didn't look right. So. Uh, what we did is, uh, I, look, I'm a miniatures guy from way back, and uh, that's really how I got into the hobby at first. I had tons of Napoleonic miniatures, and, and I mean thousands and thousands of them. So you'll notice that in most of my games, I try to get, I try to get. Actually, the first game I designed was Gettysburg: The Wheatfield, which is actually a miniatures game, just just on a, on a map. Okay, that's good to know. All right. Yeah. So. Uh, even uh, at any cost, it's got colored, uh, you know, uh, icons and, and you know, guys in uniform. I, I like that stuff. So we did that, and uh, yeah, I mean, it just worked. Once we put it laid it out on the board, it just looks right because you're looking down on the map. Mm -hmm. it looks like a bunch of guys running. And great thing about how to use the number of figures that are on the counter is the number of dice you roll, the number of combat dice you roll. Yes. So it's oh, uh, also the game function too. It's got a great user interface experience, uh, just from from my manhandling of the counters to set it up. Everything mm -hmm. was intuitively obvious, and I love I love that about game design. I, I'm I'm unsure why, and we don't need to get into this, but I'm unsure why other designers and other developers are not thinking about the art and the colors and 
what they can do with graphical cues for mm -hmm. counters and on the maps to drive the gameplay and make gameplay easier without detracting from the game itself. You know what I mean? That, that, that's interesting you bring that up because there's one thing I went back to Origins last year for the first time in 30 years or something like that, you know, and I started looking at these other games, you know, non-war games, the Euro games and the Ameritrash games, and I don't, you know, we're playing a lot because we have a group that gets together on Saturday, so if you have five or six guys sitting around, you don't really, you can't really play war games because there's no five or six player war games, so we started playing these other games. There's one other thing that's very interesting about them all, about the good ones, and then as you'll notice that they use a lot of iconography for gameplay stuff. And this, it's funny you bring this up because that's exactly why I use, we use the graphical dice, the, the custom uh, uh, dice, whereas in, in Magnuson style it was 2d6 that you cross-referenced on a matrix. And Mark and I agreed, you know, I said, Mark, we got to make this more user-friendly. I don't want guys, you know, look, I want them to roll these dice because I played some games with custom dice, Mark, and they are great because you're just rolling the dice and you look in the dice you know exactly what to do. Right? There's no, there's no looking up any further. So that's one of the, you know, that's one of the main reasons we have those movement dice now instead of the matrix. And all that iconography, all that visual aid, all that no looking up tables, that I learned that by simply playing some of these other general games and realizing, wait a minute, how come I can finish a game in two hours? You know, with a ton of minis and, and all the, these counters and, and markers and all sorts of crap going on, I can finish a game in two hours. Because oh, I'm not diving into the rule book every five seconds. You know, and on page 49 of the rule book, I find out how to do some kind of, you know, fire combat or something. So that's one of the things we want to make Crowbar very accessible, you know, user friendly, and get people started right away with it, you know, and not that you have to study it for a weekend like we do with a lot of the bigger war games, you know, I, you know, want people to set this up and start playing right away, and, and like you said, you know, figure it out, and everything kind of is logical. Yeah, um, it was an interesting, interesting uh, experience, because I, I, I got the map and the counters in, in the mail, and Mark uh, pinged me with a PDF, and I printed it out. And I was like, okay, I need to, I need to set aside time to go read the rules, and I need to go through and underline and highlight and mark things. And I'm reading the rules, going, oh, okay, and the heck with this. Let's just go set this sucker up and get after it. Right. So I'm, I've been traveling all week, but I'm ready to go. So uh, this weekend, I'm hoping to get a good gameplay in on it. But the, the, it was so, uh, it was so obvious to me what I needed to do mechanically to play the game and I, I think that is a testament and that takes nothing away from historicity or you know let's call it you know realism in air quotes right it doesn't take anything away from any of that it, 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 uh, it, it enables you to immerse yourself which I think is fab fabulous so well done well, thank you. Thank you. The dirty little secret for game designers, I think. Maybe it's just between you and me. I don't know. But <laughs> my general feeling, my general feeling is, if a good game designer can get done what he has to get done in 15 pages of rules, it doesn't require 50 pages. Anybody, my personal opinion, anybody can design a, a game of 100 pages, you know, three maps and 2,000 counters because just put everything in there. Right. Right. You, you don't have to be clever about anything, you know. Yeah. You just throw it all in there. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add. I'll just add another modifier to take care of this, and then all of a sudden you only got a hundred modifiers. Well, hundred modifiers, you can you can simulate anything. Right. The, the idea is to get that done. And I, the first time I experienced this one is when I did Race to the Sea for Yaw Magazine. Yeah. And I asked Mark. I said, Well, what are my uh, component, you know, limits and rule size and he told me well you know 15 pages for rules and, and 176 counters and all of a sudden I was thinking like this and I had to think like this right and I and Fred agrees with me because we worked on it together I said that made me such a better designer because now I'm designing to get the same 
simulation, simulation effect, the same historical accuracy, accuracy but in, in a tighter package. And it, and it makes you think of shortcuts and design for effect. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how, how can you cleverly do this and have people, like say, play a lot simpler, but still have that same that same accuracy or realism, whatever you want to call it. And that's another good game that you did, by the way, as well. So I, uh, I, I, Thank you. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. You don't have to say it. It's okay. No, no, I, I played it. I enjoyed it. I, it, it, uh, it hit the button. It was good. Uh, and, and, and not a battle that I had come across or experienced or had any real inkling uh, about, maybe do some reading, so it was good, good stuff. Right. Enjoyed it a lot. Well, look, Kev, I, I tried to, what, one of the reasons I did this, this whole gig, is I wanted to do two things. One is, I just didn't want to repeat what everybody else was designing. Yes. I, you know, I didn't think that, what, what kind of, I didn't want to my creative juices needed to do more than that if I was going to do this thing. And I didn't want to do the same battles everybody does. You know, there's so many <coughs> great battles to do that get ignored. And so, for example, Race to the Sea, I picked because I said, well, nobody ever does that part of the Western Front of World War One. Everybody stops after the Battle of Lamar. The Germans retreat to the Rhine and they, they dig in. Well, they forget that after the Germans dug in there, they started trying to outflank each other, and that was that whole race to the seaport. And I'm well, that's a fascinating thing to try to simulate. Why has anybody ever done that? Yes. And, right, and, it, and you know, it's the Battle of Mars Latour, or Pickett's Charge, or, or even even if I do a Gettysburg game, and I, well, I've done three Gettysburg games, and I may have been doing five by the time I'm done. But they never... They're, they're never the Battle, Battle of Gettysburg. Gettysburg. They're, they're always focused in on a part of the Battle of Gettysburg. Right. So, so it's either Pickett's Charge, or, or it's the Wheat Field, or it's the second day, yes. right? which is only five hours okay, from 4 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Um, the other two I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing a game on Colt Hill, which I don't think anybody's ever designed a game on Colt Hill before. I'm going to do their challenge spiel. And Fabulous. Yep. And, I'm and I'm going to do a game on the first day get it for, for Tiny Bop, which is actually going to be, be a stripped-down version of Blind Swords, Swords, which I'm working on. So. Very <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's uh, so. So I that, I love that. I, I think there's, and I'm I'm going to probably upset someone by not including them in this list, but I see yourself mm -hmm. and Tom Russell and Emanuele uh, Santander from Vento Nuevo Games. Uh, mm -hmm. Block game designer guy. Those three guys, had, I think, had, are the. When I say those three, including yourself, uh, <laughs> you three to me are, uh, in in many ways, at the. F is it fair to say at the forefront? I think you're trying to do things differently. You're trying to find new, and. Uh, and unexplored games and different mechanics and different ways to represent and different user experiences and different thinking and it just it, it gets me really excited like most of Tom Russell's games I'm it, they're, they're almost too abstract for me but his designs when you start playing them you're peeling back this onion of, of, of action and interaction and cause and effect that are just in, in game, very engaging, particularly his solo right. games are, are particularly engaging. And I find the same thing with you. You pick some, some way the hell out there sci-fi, great solo <laughs> stuff, and then you've got Crowbar, which is, as far as I'm concerned, it's a hardcore war gamer's paradise for solo play, but it's massively approachable. I mean, anyone who plays a Euro could play that game and go, oh, okay, this is kind of fun. I could get, you know. Within within reason, right? You had to have a mild right. interest, but um, those types of design and user interface and mechanics and shorter rules are leaving the uh, cognoscenti or the elitists of war game design a little bit in the dust. I think. I think the marketplace is shifting to engage with guys like yourself more and more, which is represented by the success you're having, so it's good stuff. Well, thank, thank you. And, and yes, that, that, that is something that I'm consciously trying to do, is, is to move wargaming as much as I can towards a larger crowd, you know, get, 
getting, getting more, more get exposed, exposed to more people, and, and it just has to be more approachable. Mm -hmm. um, I actually just played a great game. I don't know if you've played it. Um, Harvey and I played a game called Napoleon 1806. Is that the, Rus the Russian game? It's by Shaco. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. I haven't played that it That game is good. Okay. We had that, we opened it up out of the, out of the wrapper and had it playing in 15 minutes. It, it looks like a Euro game because it's got cubes to keep track of strength and fatigue and all that. But the way they do the card, and it's card driven, you know, so you're playing cards out of your hand for movement and all that. But the, it, it just played beautifully and it was, it, it felt right. You know, I, I was doing the Prussians and they weren't doing what I, exactly what I wanted them to do. And, you know, I jumped on Davu because he got separated and I still got my ass kicked, you know, but it felt right, you know, and that, 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 is, that kind of game, and uh, Academy Games does a lot of games that are very approachable, too, that are war games, all that 1812 and 1776 and all that, you know, those are, Vikings is a good game like that, too. Um, Legion, and Legion games are doing some good stuff as well. Yes. Yeah. yes. You know, I probably I left Kim Kanga off the list. I, I love Kim Kanga's stuff, but he he's 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 really a, a deeper level of detail design for effect Gronyardi crunchy. Yeah, he's very crunchy. Yeah, yes. which is great. Great, 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 great games. Uh, but anyway, All right, okay. Let's get back to you. But as you say, I do try to get away from those. You know, when you kind of hinted at it before, and one of the reasons that the whole Blind Swords games. They have a little trouble getting into the old crunchy Grognard region because, you know, the historical chaos that I love mm -hmm. in my games, a lot of guys aren't used to that yet. You know, they, they want to line up their counters and move them the way they want to move them and the I go, you go, and the locking zock. And, and I, you know, I... The reason I designed... The whole Blind Swords experience in the first place is I wanted my games to play like my history books read. So if I'm reading, I'll use Mars Latour as an example. If I'm reading about Mars Latour and it's telling me that there was one Prussian cavalry division that charged the entire French army on the opening day, well, well, how does my game do that? Like, if you were just setting that game up and playing it, you wouldn't do that. Right, but, but it, it happened. Right, you know, suicidal charges were done. Amazing last stands where guys retreated from perfectly fine positions because of what they saw. I'm not gonna say all. So how do you how do you get a player to experience what I feel is the historical accuracy or the, or the at least the the what's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> You know, the drama of mm -hmm. what your guys, mm -hmm. how do you react? In other words, my games are more about not planning ahead, not just having a plan A. You need a plan B and a plan C. Right. Because you're, you're reacting as you proceed through the game. You have to react to changing circumstances. And the guys who are better prepared to do that tend to do better. Yes. Now, there's certain things that you can't control. But generals had to do that, and they had to deal with it. And that's what I want my games to be. I want you to be thrown in there and go, all right, you know, I got this great plan, but guess what? First contact, everything goes to crap. Now what? <laughs> what, what do you, do now? you know, I told those guys to hold that town, and they all took off and ran away. Now what do I do? I told these guys to march over there, and they went halfway and stopped. What, what do I do? Well, this is this military history. This is what happened in my books, and I want it to happen in my games, too. Yeah, I think I, I think the there seems to be some reticence, and I and I don't have any insight into game sales for your Civil War titles with Revolution, but the there seems to be a reticence to embrace that system a little bit. That when I hear Pete attack my buddy uh, we were talking about earlier on, who says, "Oh my gosh, this is like the best." representation of civil war action without all the massive overhead of the order writing and all the sort of right. stuff that came with the civil war brigades and the micromanagement yeah, which, is, which is something i despise as well right 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 and i so, want to write during my games right and so uh <laughs> there's 
at that level, he he just finds it perfectly playable and representative of the history, and he's a, a decent Civil War fan. So mm -hmm. I can give him credit to say that you know I'll take his word for it since I'm not a Civil War buff. So I, I, there seemed to be some reticence about that chip pull mechanic for the Civil War, and I, I don't understand why. Like it's suitable for many other World War II, uh, future combat. Uh, why? What's what is it about civil the Civil War, which is basically Napoleonic style slash classical warfare with right. better, better guns and better range, right? Right, and it's actually more suited to that era because you've got more things that can go wrong in that era. Right, right. You know, people don't even appreciate the fact that those battlefields filled up with smoke after an hour. Right. So what you think is a perfectly visible enemy really can't be seen by those guys. Right. And that was something that Fred uh, pointed out to me. He went to a lecture at Gettysburg. Um, the guy who wrote this book, John Priest, I think his name is. And he said that it, you you would be surprised how uh, how chaotic and how mm -hmm. smoke filled it and all the crises that are going on the yelling and the screaming and the, the commanders can't make what you would think is a normal normal decision an informed decision they can't make it because things are just chaotic all around them so what looks perfectly doable on your war game map is not doable in real life and that's why things go to crap in my game when you think they're going to go great right. or vice versa that's fantastic and yeah. well it, it's uh, it's also part of why i like the game i like the game because you know to me it's a, it's an adventure it's an escapism if you want or it's like reading a novel or mm -hmm. or, uh, or going to a movie you know, I like to be surprised when I game, and that's why Dawn of the Zeds got created because I just like to go see zombie movies, and I just designed that to be a zombie movie. So that you know, there's no greater thing going on there. It's I'm in this thing, and it's all going to go to crap, and I'm trying to survive. And and, and yeah. to be honest with you, the greatest compliments I get from people, and including guys like Pete, you know, for the Civil War game, or for people who played Dawn of the Zeds for all these years, is that, that when they write an AAR an after action report they're not talking about the rules or the mechanics or, or anything what they're doing is just telling you a story about what happened right right, right. right. they write it as if they're writing a paragraph in a, in a history book or in a novel and to me that's the greatest compliment I could get because yeah. they're not referring to it as a game they're referring it to it as an experience you're making the game come alive inside someone's head and that's that's when I blog the, the ones that I write narrative for that's because mm -hmm. it's exploding inside my my, my little pea brain, and we're, right. we're and I'm I'm like wow I can see this and so let me let me try and grab a note and uh, or a picture that encapsulates the story that's be, that's unfolding before me as I play and right. that, and that right. is a great game that makes a great game so uh, and and I feel the same way and that's the way I try to design and, and that that. You know the historical chaos adventure thing. Even in like something in Crowbar, or in, you'll you'll note that there's not just that push your luck element, but um, on certain results you'll have to pull a chit. Yes. All right. Now those chits are ranger events on one side and German events on the other, and this is this is where I sneak in my historical chaos. So when you have to pull a chit, that can create an event anywhere in the battlefield. So it's not just the guy you're concentrating on that second. That's not what's going on necessarily. You could be resolving something on the other side of the field with this chip. You, it may present you with an opportunity that for a company that you thought was dead in the water, and all of a sudden you get this one chip that says Rangers lead the way. You can pick any one unit, move it two spaces, and do something with it. Well, now that guy that you thought was dead that you rolled like crap for, now all of a sudden you can go over there and move him and do something. Now all of a sudden everything's changed. So, or, you know, some artillery barrage will just fall right in the middle of your perfectly fine bunch of guys, and they're all, like, shattered and shaken, and they're not what do I do. You know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It, yes, it's it, always, yeah. I know, people yell at me, but I always get it in there somehow, you know. Yeah, that's great. That is excellent. So, so now, when, so you, you, so you've gone through just trying to reel us back in on the topic, on a crowbar, and, the, and your yes. design experience there, we had... 
discussion about history, discussion about the maps and columns and uh, chaos and all that. Now, I noticed in the Kickstarter that's running right now and doing well, which is great, by the way, uh, okay. that uh, there is a co-op option. Yes. So, how? Another what? thing I learned at Origins that you have to have Okay, and this goes back to what I said before about my play, you know, my playing group on Saturdays. If I'm playing with a bunch of guys, it's hard to pick a two-player war game up into a bunch of guys. So having that co-op option, that's how you get around with a lot of these games. Is you're, you're playing with five guys together and you're on, you know, if we're playing Legends of Andor, we're all in like, like this Lord of the Rings type quest and we're all playing together, yep. you know, to beat the system. So, uh, yes, the game was is primarily designed as a solitaire game as was in, in magnificent style but then i said well all right we gotta have a co-op version so three guys could play together you know if you're sitting there on a saturday afternoon you know, you want so each guy can take one company right and then you just change the way it's uh, deployed a little bit you know on the german side so that you have an equal chance at victory points and you basically compete against each other you race each other to see who can do the best out of the company um, we're working on a four-player version where one guy, the fourth guy, actually plays the Germans. And the uh, the four of us uh, add-on there that you saw is actually a whole re-engineering where the Rangers defend their position and you play as the Germans oh. trying to drive them back to the, to the cliff. Yes. Interesting. Okay. There's a lot of different ways to play that game, as you can tell. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, that and then so you know, did did you come up with those ideas, or did someone else come up with those ideas? What? How did how did the the design? It started the as just happen? yeah, it just started as a multi you know the three player multiplayer and the and the four player, and then Mark actually because one of the things I'm finding out about Kickstarters is that when you get into the stretch goal stuff, you have to start you have to start thinking of other stuff, right? right? You know, to how do you add to this design? So when Mark said, "Well, we need them, you know, we need more, you know, more stuff to add on. Can you think outside the box a little bit, you know?" And I originally had said, "Well, we could have the Germans attack the Rangers," and then he, to his credit, he came up with the idea of actually having the players switch their their side entirely. Hmm. In other words, they actively play as the Germans, and the Rangers are played by the system. So he gets credit for that. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, that's very cool. And actually, my uh, Fred just wrote me before. Fred Fred's been my developer for years, and he's great to come up with. Uh, you know, he comes up with some key ideas every once in a while. He just he just said we had just played Fortress America a couple of weeks ago, and he said to me, "Why don't you have an option where you play multiplayer, but the guy from Dog Company plays the Germans against Easy Company, right? So that you're playing the Germans on the other guy's sector." <laughs> so I, said, I like that idea. <laughs> oh, That's I great. love that idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to work that in there somewhere. Oh, that's clear. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Why did you do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you could have taken it easy on me. Look where I'm at. Oh, that's yeah, that's great. great. <laughs> yeah. And so, so uh, the, 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 obviously, the packaging is the classic. Uh, it's funny how we say classic and company's been around for three or four years but flying right. pigs high quality nice box great map is it going to be a mounted map or is it a paper map? yes it'll be a mounted map yeah beautiful okay so because it's big i was surprised at how big the map is um, yeah 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 it takes up a bit of room yeah it does but it, it's it's gorgeous looking um so from a rule writing perspective you've talked a little bit about design for effect but to, to kind of uh, bring things to a close, when you're uh, when you're crafting rules, what's going through your what's going through your mind when you're wordsmithing, right? Is that is that an easy thing for you to, you to do? Can you just sit down and go, okay, you want to do this, then you, you you can write a sentence and it's perfect. How how does that work for you? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Um, I usually end up, and this is, I don't know, I'm sure that other designers will tell you this too, that once I start on a project, I, I, I get these little epiphanies, and they're usually when I'm in the shower, or I'm walking my dog, or I'm driving to work, so what ends up happening is I get all these little scraps of paper piled, piled together, 
you know, with I can't forget this, you know, and I'll jot it down. And, and luckily at work, I have a lot of free time at work because I'm I'm an accountant. So for a freight forwarding company, and we have these like one busy week a month, and the rest of the weeks are kind of easy going. And you know, so during lunch and stuff, and or if I'm waiting for reports to get printed, I'm usually I can usually you know jot down some notes. So my rules kind of start off as almost as a player aid, right? Which is just a summary of of what I came up with and how the game will flow. Then what I usually do is I already start building the kit, you know, the play test kit, and I always try to make my play test kits attractive, physically attractive, because it inspires me. You know, so I'll put clip art on there or anything just to just to make it pop and get me excited about playing with them. Because if it was just a plain white counter, I might I might get bored. So I just try to make them a little. You know, a little colorful and. Uh, oh, that's interesting. And okay. I'll, I'll, I'll sit there. Uh, I usually push it around first myself, just to see if things, how things are working, and then if I get things clicking along, and I, then I add a couple more sentences, and I realize I have to add some more detail, and it kind of, it, it's kind of an expanding player aid, all right. Then Fred will come over, and we'll we'll, we'll play it out, and we'll, you know, and I, it just constantly grows like that, like a fungus. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's fungal rule writing. Okay, that's going to be the the Lutman way from now on. Okay. That's right. So, but I'm always I'm always going in there and fiddling and adding a sentence and um, I try to make it conversational. Like you'll notice in Crowbar that I don't use cases. I use letters and then numbers. I just try to make it as simple as possible. I try to add little sidebar notes in there, either historical or just, you know, designer notes or whatever, or clarifications. Um, but it, it just basically grows like that. Then Fred is the guy who actually does the uh, first hardcore proofreading of it, where he fixes all the English, or you should really say it this way, that kind of stuff. So, it, yeah. So I, I do not sit down and just blop out rules. They, they just grow and expand and get cut and moved and all that kind of stuff over time. Okay, okay. That's, that's fascinating. So that's the, you're the first person that I, I think that I've, when I've done this, these interviews that has been able to articulate their rule writing exercise. So you're, you're, you're miles ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot more, I tell you, there's a lot more going on in your brain than, than you can put down on paper sometimes. Yes. Right? And, and I'm always afraid when I have that one great idea as the dog's pooping or something, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to forget that. That's going to work brilliantly, you know, and then you throw it on a piece of paper, and then you just, you know, get this folder of right. stuff. Right, right. That's awesome. Uh, That's awesome. Well, so, um, thank you for sharing uh, these insights. I'm so glad we finally got together. Right? Yeah, well, it took a while, right? It took a while. But I, I tell you what, I think... I think this is opportune, though, right? It's kind of kismet because we uh -huh. we had planned to discuss some of your other designs and uh, approaches to designing in general, and they were, I would say, much smaller endeavors, perhaps, than Crowbar. Crowbar feels like a, a well, a bigger format, more high dollar, higher production value game than than perhaps most of the others, except maybe. Uh, uh, at any cost, right? At any cost is the biggest and the longest one I've done so far. That was four years of design work for Fred and me. Yeah, we, we worked a long time. And even Long Street Attacks is, I think it's the biggest game that Revolution's done. Um, that took almost as long to get right. So it's, yeah, it's weird. The games are getting bigger. And bigger. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Huh. yeah. Why do you think that is? I think it's just a timing thing because I actually, to be honest with you, I, I prefer smaller foot, footprint games. I was always a fan, I don't know if you remember Rob Markham, right, back in through the 3W days. He did Sword and Shield uh, quads and he did Blood and Iron and he always designed the way I, he was like my inspiration to design because he could do quads about battles that nobody heard of but using this clever little, you know, he always had a mechanic or two that was different than anybody else had at the time. And but they were they were small, they were smaller footprint games. So they were you know smaller maps with, with smaller battles, but they were so interesting. And I just like being able to play. I'm not a you know I'm not a monster game guy. You know, 
uh, I always, I guess I admire or, or fear or whatever these guys who can play at Concert World Expo and they got five map sheets out and 2,000 counters and I just look at them and just go, nah, that's, that's not for me. <laughs> It's, it's never been for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's something to it. There's something to that epic scope that uh, it appeals to me. But I also, you know, I'm I'm all over the place. I, lo I love all of it. So, uh, well, that's it. That's very cool. All right. Um, well, thank you again. I'm glad we got together. Get together, and I hope this is not the last time we get to have a chat either. We can we can we can speak anytime you want, Kev. I, I mean it. <laughs>